think my biggest breakthrough as an evolution biologist was when I learned that the Soviet Union was teaching evolution biology through the work of Kropotkin, whose major book was Mutual Aid and was all about cooperation in nature, while the West was being taught the Darwinian struggle for survival, hostile competition, get, make it to the top of the pile kind of evolution biology. And what I saw in nature was both that kind of hostile competition and the cooperation. And so I worked for a long time on how, how to put those two together until it dawned on me that we had here a maturation cycle, that Darwin was talking about the first part, the youthful part. And when there's huge creativity along with all the hostility. So um, in fact, Biologists know ecosystems by the designations pioneer and climax, type ones and type three ecosystems. And they'll tell you that the species in a type one ecosystem are feisty, competitive, take all the territory they can, all the resources they can, uh, multiply as fast as possible and bump off their enemies. While in a type three climax ecosystem, you see the species tightly interwoven, feeding each other, um, sharing territory and resources in very cooperative ways. Now, when you're a Western scientist and you don't believe consciousness is primary and you see it all as accident, non-intelligent, you can't see a learning curve because nature presumably can't learn, it's not intelligent. But when you have a worldview that's rooted in consciousness, in aliveness, in intelligence, you see that the young species eventually get it that feeding your enemy is more energy efficient, cheaper, than killing them. And those species are the ones that survive for a long haul because they've become mature and cooperative and build these wonderful ecosystems like rainforests and prairies and coral reefs where everything is feeding everything else. And even the predator-prey relationship that they're so fond of showing you on television as blood and gore are, are cooperative systems in which the job of the prey species is to pick off only the unhealthiest, the slowest, the ones that can't run so fast, which improves the species, the, 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 the predators, I mean, have that job, the prey is getting stronger by running harder, right? So the predator-prey relationship is something that stays in balance. If the predators eat too many, then they'll start to die off because there won't be enough food, and so the thing constantly rebalances itself. And so in my evolutionary theory, I see this maturation curve. Now, we don't kill off adolescents if we want grown-ups, right? It's just as valuable to be young as it is to be older. So we need both of these things. And capitalism is a clear case of a juvenile mode of economics. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory sense, but only to know that it will outlive its, its usefulness and that it has to collapse to give way to the more mature mode of cooperating. So we're very afraid in the United States of socialism, you know, Obama is a socialist and stuff. What do you mean by socialism? Friendly, cooperative societies? Is that so scary? Um, <laughs> might it not be better than severe exploitation using a money system that was designed to concentrate wealth in few hands? Well, what's the process of globalization? To me, it's exactly that evolutionary maturation process where we are moving into increasing levels of cooperation. Now, the juvenile mode wants to protect itself. It's still feisty. It liked that banking system that concentrates the wealth. But if you look at your body, which has 50 trillion cells, each of which is as complex as a large human city, and see that its economics are in the mature cooperative mode, wow, what's happening? In each of our cells, there are about a thousand mitochondria which were once free-living bacteria billions of years ago, who learned that maturation, and, and while they had developed many lifestyles in the immature mode, they put them to use in a division of labor, forming the only other kind of cell ever to evolve on this planet, the nucleated cells that you and I are made of, are bacterial colonies. 
So the descendants of those ancient free-living bacteria in our cells, the ones called mitochondria, are the bankers. What do they do? 24-7, they're giving out free stored value debit cards, which you take and you spend into the cellular economy, and when you've spent it, you take it back to the bank. You never pay it back, much less interest. You get a new, new line on your card. Fantastic, isn't it? The bank's job is just to regulate how much currency needs to be circulating. But there's no reason for money to be scarce. There's no reason to have poverty and wealth in huge, massively different uh, proportions. If we followed nature, if we had a real science of economics, which we don't, because our economics are based on, on poor observations of human psychology the Darwinian notion that everyone must only be self-interested and competitive, right? Juvenile mode. Now in the world, we have over a million NGOs. Paul Hawkins' book has, has really documented this. Those NGOs are trying to make a better world, and they're communicating with each other through the Internet. The Internet is the biggest self-organizing living system on the planet, and it's very prone to gifting economies, to cooperation, right? It's hard to exploit it. It's hard to control it. Nobody's able to. It's a true maturing living system. Sure, it's doing all the pornography and now all the, the marketing and things like that, but in its essence, it's a self-organizing living system that I think is helping us to move into the mature mode as a species. So. We're having all these crises now, the banking crisis, the oil crisis, the aging population crisis, you name it, there's a crisis. Nature doesn't fix what isn't broken. It is profoundly conservative with things that work well and radically creative when things don't work. And my hope for the human species comes with, first of all, let's get our oneness. If we get our oneness, it's much easier to move into the cooperative mode. You get rid of enemies. You discern the plot of the human drama without judging it. And so you're in a much better mood for talking to enemies and resolving problems. So I, I have a lot of hope for where we're going. The religions are cooperating. The arts are cooperating. The sciences are cooperating. We have international space stations. We can trade money around all languages and cultures and money systems. We're building European unions and United States, is, and you know we're practicing cooperation, but it has to move to a global level now. So if we wake up, if we know our oneness, if we see the maturation curve in biology, so that we're putting together the keyboard of the physics universe of vibrations and the biology of maturation and the economics of our living bodies, then we'll see everything that we can do to revise our world into a mature mode. And I like to say to young people, you know, you want to be a techie instead of an organic farmer? That's okay. Just don't put any toxins in it. Make it fully recyclable, just the way nature made you, without toxins and recyclable. Gave you this body, right? You can move on afterwards into another incarnation, but follow it for now. Ground cosmic love all the way down to your toes. That's what you're here for. You know, that's, if we can live that, we could have, we could make paradise of Earth. Probably we won't, because I think there will always be souls incarnating who need to learn, who need to grow up, who need to go through the maturation process. But maybe at least we could have enough basic cultures here who had grown up so that we could have multiple sciences and give each other space for our individual realities as well as our different cultural realities and use that diversity without which nature cannot be creative in positive, friendly ways. What I call indigenous science is more than what they intuited by looking inward. To, through their dreams and intuitions and so forth, but also what they have studied in the outside world. And I've had indigenous friends say, you know, your Western science works on the outside material world, and your Eastern science is working on the inside 
the mind and the discipline of the mind and so forth. But we indigenous people can give you the third leg of the stool so that you can have it stand up solidly because we work with the inside and the outside. We see them the way you see light and dark or night and day or anything. They're just the two faces of reality. And so they work both with the inside to the point where in many indigenous cultures they could commune without communicating in great detail they could do direct mind-to-mind transmission and had a spoken language for when that was needed. They knew the eternal now and they knew the linear time. They studied, oh, your average Amazon kid probably can identify 300 species of bees by body shape, by behavior, by what it might be good for medicinally and so forth. Very scientific evidence gathered over time. They have a botany, they have an astronomy, they've watched the stars for thousands of years. They know the patterns, they know the sequences. They have medicine, they have physics, they have biology, they have agronomy. Half the food eaten in the world today was developed by the indigenous people of the Andes. All of the corn, all of the amaranth grains, all of the potatoes, all of the tomatoes, eggplants, veggie, uh, things of that kind, you know, huge scientific contributions. A very scientific agriculture in which fields were designated in the sacred valley of Peru, for instance, at all the altitudes trying out the different seeds so that they would know what grew in which climate best and could export those to that part of the Inca Empire where they would grow best. Very sophisticated sciences. We're not talking about just stumbling on facts because they were around for so long, but looking for information and systematically testing their hypotheses about uh, whatever it was and coming to conclusions that were, worked very well and kept those cultures alive for much longer than any of our contemporary cultures are lasting. We seem to be moving into a a speed up here. (laughs) I do believe that consciousness evolves in the same sense that in biology what we see as evolution is from the simple to the complex and then the complex re-simplifying and forming new complexities. And I think exactly the same situation probably prevails in big mind, which starts out in total aware bliss and nothingness, no thingness, and then dreams up worlds. And these worlds become complex and they take on a life of their own. And maybe all that is is, you know, just wants to see itself and observe itself through all the points of consciousness that arise within it. You know, I see every point in time space is a unique perspective on the whole, but reaches to the whole. Our consciousness have no boundary. We can go straight into the deep waters where eternal consciousness is still perfectly unruffled. And then the higher you get up in the ocean, the more it's boiling up and we're kind of on the surface waves of it. So we can go down into that utter stillness, that bliss, that light, that love that we try to describe in words that is nameless. And it's still the same universe. The turmoil and the stillness are all part of the universe. We can play any music we want on the keyboard of vibrations from matter to spirit. I was taught the Western science story of evolution, which of course is the Darwinian model. And according to the Western science, the Earth forms in a material universe that has no purpose or no meaning through accidental collisions over time and aggregates of uh, subatomic particles into atoms and atoms into molecules and so on. And I changed my basic assumptions about science somewhere along the line and adopted the concept of a living universe. Now one of the advantages of a living universe, besides the fact that almost all human cultures have seen it that way, is that you don't have to work out how to get life out of non-life or consciousness out of non-consciousness or intelligence out of non-intelligence 
because you make the basic fundamental assumption from the beginning that it all starts with cosmic consciousness, aliveness, intelligence, all inherent in this source consciousness within which matter arises, within that non-duality, the dualities of matter arise like waves on a sea. In fact, one of my favorite creation stories is the Hindu story that it starts with an unlimited smooth sea of milk, the ultimate big mama issue and kind of metaphor. And within that sea of milk, a little wavelet forms and forever after, it's torn between loving its unique identity and wanting to merge back into the safety, the security of the Big Mama. And I think that is the central tension that drives all evolution. The, the part and the whole, the one and the other, many other wavelets form. The wavelets look at each other and eventually forget that they're part of the sea. So they come to see themselves as disconnected individuals. Now, in Western science, as I was taught it in the Darwinian theory, uh, life comes out of collisions of molecules and stuff in the soup of the early planet Earth. Uh, once the lava keeps coming up and steaming off and gassing off and falling back to Earth as rain and, you know, the planet gets coated in water and all that uh, kind of story that we know. And then we talk about the primeval sea in which molecules had lightning bolts striking them and all kinds of activities going on there energetically until the molecules somehow come together and form the first ancient bacteria. And that is thought to be now almost four billion years ago. So um, in my view, nature is all alive and intelligent and conscious down to subatomic particles, all consciousness all within consciousness. That's the Vedic science basic assumptions. Whereas the assumptions I was taught, non-living universe turned into living universe. Um, objectivity, we can study nature from a distance as scientists without affecting it. And in the Vedic view, you would say, no, it's all self-organizing, it's all participatory. You are in the universe and everything you do, even observation, affects what, it's, what you're observing. So I work with these different worldviews, these different fundamental assumptions. And we have been talking about this for a long time in Western science. Many of us switch to the Vedic assumptions especially in the 50s and 60s when many young intellectuals went off to India and came back with these ideas of a very different way of seeing our universe. And they brought back gurus with them and people learned yoga and got interested in this other science, a science that was much more about studying the mind, the inside, than what Western science was doing, which was looking outward at a material world and how to understand it. So I think those of us who made that shift, and some of us are here at this conference, um, decided that the world made more sense to us using the Vedic assumptions. Now, you cannot do science without having basic assumptions. You have to have some notion of what kind of a universe you're making theories of. So you have to decide, is this a non-living universe or a living universe? Is this a, um, a universe in which consciousness gives rise to matter or a universe in which matter gives rise to consciousness? Is it an objective universe to be studied or is it participatory so that I affect what I'm looking at? These are all choices of cultural beliefs about the universe. So from my point of view, it's wrong that Western science gained the hegemony which enabled it to say there can only be science. There can't be different sciences. Science is science. And as a result, Western science is taught in universities all over the world. Regardless of whether the culture had a science of its own, it gets taught Western science in graduate school and even undergraduate school and even in grammar schools. 
So um, my work in the world now is to try to bring out the fact that science is necessarily built on unproven assumptions, which are all actually cultural beliefs of a particular time in human history and a particular culture in human history. So Western science begins in Europe with the Enlightenment, with the power base shifting from church and state to the new business entrepreneurs who took in the science that church rejected and made it a powerful ally for its engineering spin-offs. And then the secular state gets created and the church and state has lost power. The entrepreneurs and science have gained power. So it is decreed in a secular state, state that there should be a division between religion and politics. Um, and science gets the mandate to tell the new creation story that the church had told before. So that's just a historical trajectory that enabled science to become very powerful in terms of telling the story people believe in as what kind of universe do I live in? What is it like for people to be in it? How can it be studied? How can we know how it works? All of that stuff that science does for us. Um, but you get very different stories and different theories if you start with different assumptions. So I would like to see a consortium of sciences in the world in which we can revive Islamic science and Vedic science and Taoist science and indigenous sciences, all of which have contributed enormously to human knowledge, and let them have uh, dialogue with each other such as the religions do. We now have world parliaments of religion and they are learning to get along with each other and to respect each other and we could be doing the same thing with science. Now if you think of a science based on the concept of a living universe versus one built on the concept of a non-living universe, you see some serious differences arising. In Western science with its non-living universe assumptions, all biology is treated as mechanism. And a microbiologist is looking at the mechanism of DNA and the protein and how these things operate like machinery in your cell. And so they started to do genetic engineering. And they treated it as if this genome were like a machine in which you could unscrew one thing and stick something else in and then you would get the result that you wanted, the way an engineer would with a machine if he understood the machine. Unfortunately, Western science doesn't understand biology very well because it's not used to thinking in terms of life. It's used to thinking in terms of machinery. And so when they started doing genetic engineering for a long time, the genes that they implanted would simply disappear. And the companies like Monsanto learned not to give any guarantees about them because they couldn't guarantee the harvests. Eventually, they learned how to kind of crazy glue, shoot them in under pressure and, and crazy glue them into the genome so that the genome couldn't reject them. You see, a living system cleans up errors. It's feminine in that regard. It's always house cleaning, right? If the mutations that happened in your genome didn't get cleaned up, you wouldn't last very long. So I came to see evolution not as being dependent on these mutations, but as being dependent on the intelligent proteins that could select which genes should be put into use when and how. So we have had over half a century actually of Western science results in biology that show that genomes get rearranged when there's any kind of a crisis. And this was Barbara McClintock, who finally got a Nobel Prize for it after being called crazy. And a lot of people since then, wonderful teams in England, that have shown us that life is highly intelligent, that it self-organizes, that it maintains itself, unlike machinery, which has to be repaired all the time. And, you know, if you want generations of computers, you, they don't give birth to each other. You, they're, Occasionally, Western science uses a living metaphor like that, but what they mean is somebody has reinvented a new form of computer. So I spent many years distinguishing between mechanism and organism in order to understand how life works. 
if we had a science based on the ideas of a living universe that could talk as equals with Western science rooted in its mechanical metaphors, that science, living science, let's say, could show them why it's wrong to mess around in the genome the way they are, why it is not producing good results. Unfortunately, we live in a market economy where the market is much more important than the scientific demonstration of improvement in life. And as far as I know, there is as yet not a single instance of a genetically engineered organism that is improving life. Um, take the case of yellow rice, for example, that they say now is going to give the, the drug can be implanted in the rice that will prevent the children from going blind, who are going blind now in parts of Asia. Well, if they hadn't rearranged their whole food production ecosystems, the children wouldn't have gone blind in the first place. The way to cure the blindness is to go back to organic farming. The yellow rice is like a patchwork that you're trying to put on top of a problem that you created when you didn't have to create it. So that's just an example of why I think we need a consortium of sciences in the world.